Hello, everybody. We are back with part two of our yoga um, class wellness teaching. I'm super excited. We have Dr. Sandra with us again. Um, she is a Yoga Alliance uh, continuing education provider, and she also does a lot of yoga classes online and uh, in person. So uh, I'm going to get her on. We're going to get into this right away. Last time we talked about yoga and um, all the benefits uh, that it has. And today we are actually going to jump into it and start doing yoga. And believe me, it's going to be a completely different ball game when you learn it from somebody and they can tell you the pros and cons and do's and don'ts, uh, all those little things you can't learn from just watching a video. So here we go. You guys are in for a treat. Hi, Dr. Sandra. How are you? Oh, Dr. Farin. Namaste. It's so good to see you and to be with everyone again. Yeah, same here. I am super excited. As everybody can see, you're already ready to go. Absolutely. So we are super excited. Um, just gonna for people who haven't seen part one of this video, uh, let me just give you a small recap. We are doing yoga today. We're gonna be doing a couple of different uh, poses in yoga, and um, just a little something about yoga. I personally love doing yoga because it uh, works on your balance. It works on your uh, uh, balance, your strengthening, your flexibility, you and uh, calming yourself down with meditation. So it's a hole in one. I absolutely love it. Um, and today, Dr. Sandra is actually going to show us some of the poses. So I don't want to take any of her time. Um, if you can start with the breathing for us. Yes. Um, and I will follow it with you. And then you can go into the poses and, you know, we'll take it from there. Absolutely. Last time we talked a little bit about the basic box breathing. So I want to elaborate on that. Right now I'm sitting in a cross-legged seat. I've put a yoga block under my, what are called sits bones, so that I've elevated my seat a little bit up. That allows me to have my back straight. I had just have my hands resting on top of my knees. You can have them on top of the thighs. And box breathing is very simple as a box has four corners. So box breathing has four elements. You inhale for a count, hold it for the same count, exhale for the full count, and then hold that for a full count. So we'll try it on counts of four. Let me talk you through that. You'll inhale through the nose, three, four, then hold, two, three, four. You'll exhale steadily, three, four, and hold that, two, three, four. And then we continue. So the thing to remember in this is that you want to perhaps soften your gaze or close your eyes because all you want to do is be aware of your breath. And you want to get the shoulders down and back because it's easy to hunch over when you're seated like this. But that squeezes the ribs down onto the diaphragmatic muscle, which is the muscle which does your breath work for you. It pulls your air in. It pushes your air out. Your lungs don't have muscles. All they are are basically big empty balloons. It's the diaphragm that creates the suction to pull the air in, and then it pushes up to help you push the air back out. So roll your shoulders back, get comfortable, maybe seated on a block or seated flat on the ground, and let's try it. Remember, we're breathing in through the nose. Ready? Inhale. Two, three, four. Hold it. Two, three, four, exhale through the nose, three, four, and hold that, two, three, roll the shoulders back, inhale, two, three, four, and hold, two, three, four, now exhale through the nose, three, four, and hold, two, Three, let's do it one more time. Inhale deeply, steadily, four, and hold, feeling yourself filled with air, four, and exhale, two, three, four, and hold, two, three, four. One of the tricky bits about doing this is that it's so easy to lose track of, am I holding or am I breathing in or breathing out? Sometimes I mess up. Sometimes you will probably mess up. It's okay. It's not a contest. No one's keeping score. And you find when you finish that you feel very light and filled with good fresh air. If you get a little dizzy, and sometimes some people do uh, simply get a little, a little, shall we say, over oxygenated, then just stop and breathe normally. 
inhaling and exhaling through the nose and roll the shoulders a bit, perhaps lie out, uh, lie down on your mat until you feel a little more steady and then lean your back against something like a wall or do this in a chair until you get a little more steady. That's uh, absolutely true because a lot of time people don't realize and, you know, they start the breathing and they get so excited and they might even try to hold it for a long period of time, you yes. know, just because not a good idea. Start, start slow and then build yourself up. So you're absolutely right. That dizziness, it's, it happens. So just be mindful of that and yes. you'll be fine. Yes, but absolutely. That was awesome. I did it with you right now and I always feel so much more calmer and uh, collected. So we are ready Thank to go you. into our poses now. Yes, yes. So what I've done is I've chosen four poses that are used in almost every yoga class that you can imagine from beginner on up to power yoga and advanced yoga. But these are poses that often are done with uh, some need of correction. I won't say that they're done wrong, but they could be done better. And mostly that has to do with body alignment. So the very first one is the one in which we're in right now, Sukhasana. Now, right now I'm going to remove the block I'm sitting on. Sukhasana means an easy seated pose. Sitting on my sits bones, I have my ankles crossed right in front of me. Now this is the way that a little child will sit when they're first learning to sit upright. Very natural, very um, intuitive. But here's the problem. If you look from the side, when we sit here, you'll notice that my shoulders have come forward. My back is slightly rounded, so I'm really not sitting up straight. And unless the yoga teacher walks around the class during the class, they will not notice perhaps that this is so. So you want to roll the shoulders down and back as if you're making big circles from the front to back. And then imagine the top of your shoulders rolling down the back, rolling into the hip pockets of your jeans or your skirt. And you'll notice that now my shoulders are in line with my ear and in line with my hips. So ear, shoulder, and hip are in a straight line. Another good way to help with this, if this puts a little too much tension on your spine, take a yoga block, roll forward and put it right underneath those sits bones. This elevates your seat off the floor and then keeping your feet in that cross-legged position, rest the hands on the knees, roll the shoulders back, and you'll notice that you have a beautiful sense of pulling the spine up from the base of the hips and it's in a beautiful alignment coming right out through the top of the head, the crown chakra or the Sahasrara chakra. And so you feel a sense of lengthening, of tallness. This also helps with the breathing, even in just an everyday mindfulness, because we want to get those ribs up and off the diaphragm. And I will say that in our technologically marvelous 21st century lives, we spend a lot of times doing this because we're at the computer or we're driving a car with bucket seats or we're sitting down at a table, roll the shoulders back, stretch the spine up. You are 100% right. I literally today at, um, I work in a special needs school as a physical therapist. So this is something that we discuss in classrooms uh, with teachers, with OTs and stuff, is our children also there. This is, the, you know, it's not just us at work. It's our kids constantly in this position. Yes. And if, the, if they're on their phones now, even more so. So yes. you, this is something, this just this position like the way dr sandra showed you is something you can do in your chairs at work you can teach it to your kids and you can tell them to be mindful of taking these breaks and fixing their posture because then all of a sudden at a certain age you i'm seeing it now a lot more because technology is so much more kids with rounded shoulders and hunched backs yes because even at home this is what they're doing and it's becoming so prevalent in the last seven eight years that we need to now make that very mindful changes for us and for our kids. And we need to talk to them about it. We need to tell them and exactly the way Dr. Sandra did it. If you just do this sitting down in a chair as well, all of these things apply. So that that's definitely a, a point you guys should take note of. And this is something you can do if you are sitting at a bus stop riding in a bus that has hard seats. If you're sitting in a waiting room at your dentist or your doctor, Anywhere that you can sit in a firm seat, you can take this time to practice. So let's move on to the second one. You often hear about the pose downward facing dog. The Sanskrit name is Adho Mukha Savasana, downward face dog pose. We do this 
with the hands, fingers spread wide on the mat, shoulder distance apart, curl the toes under, and then lift the knees so that the hips are at their highest point. Ideally, you want to have the feet hip distance apart and the heels pressed down toward the mat. Some of you may be able to get the heels to touch the mat. Some of you may not be. Either way is fine, so please don't feel that you're not doing the pose. Here's the tricky bit with this one. It's considered a resting pose. Now, I've got my head lower than my heart, but take a look at my alignment. I'm, I'm careless. I've let my chest sag downward. If I push up through the base of my hands, my shoulders round, and now I have better alignment with my shoulders, but I don't exactly have good alignment because I need to have a straight line from my head to my hips. So I push back into my heels and bring my head down. Now you'll notice that I have more of that letter V shape. I'm also getting much more of a stretch here in the back of my calves and thighs. So I've, I'm doing what's called embodying the pose fully. And I'm working a lot more muscle groups because I'm thinking about my alignment. Now, for those of you who may have problems with wrist issues, perhaps you have carpal tunnel syndrome or you've had wrist surgery, bring your blocks to the mat and get used to using blocks because these are not for people who, quote, can't do yoga. These are the yoga practitioner's best friend. They bring the floor up to you. So for these, place them shoulder distance apart up here. Bring the palm of the hand to the part of the block closest to you. Press into that, wrap your fingers around the block, then lift those hips, press into the block, bring the head down. You can adjust the block distance as needed. And this brings just a little bit more height. It also engages much more of the tricep muscle here and more of the shoulder assembly. So there are a number of ways that you can use blocks to improve almost every asana that you can think of. Any comments, Dr. Frey? Yeah, this is one of my favorite poses because this is when I actually go around and push everybody into that position. Yes. And it's just awesome because people are like, I got this. And then they're like, ooh. And I love it because I just go like, right. And I'm like, no, this is where you need to be. And it's it's so amazing. Then they're like, wow, this is what I'm supposed to feel like. Yes. Yeah. So that's why when I told you guys, this video is not just about, um, poses it's how you need to do it because these little things it's what makes a difference when you're doing that pose correctly or not that this is where all the difference comes and this is such True. an amazing pose to be in because you're getting your strengthening yes. you're getting your flexibility i mean people think when you're in yoga one of the first classes i did they're like i never knew yoga can like make my muscles hurt i was like yes because you're doing it properly mm -hmm. and you're holding the positions and you will feel it because your muscles are working, which of is course. the right way of doing yoga. So you're absolutely right. That that going down another 20% or 20 degrees is what makes the whole difference. That perfect V is what you want to see. You're absolutely right. And you can think V for victory. If I do it right, I've achieved victory. Yes. <laughs> and you can start wherever, just as long as your goal is the V, right? If you start here, I don't care. Exactly. You yourself in and, you know, eventually you'll get there. Right. The nice thing about yoga is no one is keeping score. If it yep. takes you longer to achieve the V, maybe it takes you weeks or months. Great. It takes you weeks or months. A mighty oak tree doesn't grow into an acorn overnight. It takes time. Yep. All right. The next one we're going to look at is garland pose, malasana. And if you've uh, been around yoga for a while, you've heard the term mala, and that is the string of 108 beads with a larger bead and a tassel at the end that many uh, yoga practitioners wear as a spiritual reminder. It's very much like the Catholic rosary, except that it's twice as many beads. The Catholic rosary is 54. The japa mala of yoga is 108. 108 is a very auspicious number in, uh, in a great deal of, of yogic thought. But let's get to that pose. Now, garland pose has you actually suspended from your knees, almost like a hammock, as a garland is hung between two points. And then your hands are in Anjali Mudra with your elbows pressed to the insides of the knees. So usually you get into the pose by 
letting your toes spill off the sides of the mat in a deep yogic squat, squatting down. Then you bring the elbows to the inside of the knees, press the hands in Anjali Mudra, thumbs into the chest. All right, technically I'm in Malasana, but look at my back. My back is rounded and my head is a, is a head of my spine. So right now I'm actually doing a very poor spinal alignment. If I press into my knees and roll my shoulders back, pull my head up, now I have a straight line from the crown of my head down to my coccyx, my tailbone. I'm pressing my elbows into my knees so that I'm able to use that resistance to pull my shoulders back and pull my spine up. Let me show you what it looks like from the front. So I bring these out. I'm pressing my heels down into the mat for good stability, rolling the shoulders back. So my, well, my lower arms, my forearms are creating a nice straight line and I'm also using the resistance pressing in. Now, what about those people who try as they might, just can't get those heels down to the mat? I have a solution for you. Get two blocks. I'll show you from the side. Roll up one foot onto the ball of the foot, place your heel on the edge of the block, shift over and place the block on the other side. So now you're up on the ball of the foot, but your heels are resting on these blocks. Bring the knees wide, press those elbows into the inside of the knees, Roll the shoulders back, hands in Anjali Mudra, and let that head, neck, and spine come into alignment. So yes, you are up on the ball of your foot, but you're not going to roll backwards because the blocks provide good alignment for you, and you're not straining or hurting yourself to overstretch that calf muscle or that Achilles tendon. If you're one of the people who, in your practice, can get your heel down to the mat, then simply roll back on that heel, still pressing down mostly through the ball of the foot, just get that spine in alignment. And you're working a great deal of the muscle here, the hamstrings, the back of the thigh. You're also getting a lot of resistance here through the biceps, you're pressing and the triceps. You're pulling the shoulder blades together. So that's your scapula here and the trapezius muscles pulling together. So you are doing a full body toning in Malasana. Dr. Farin, can you comment on that? Yes. Uh, this is, I mean, think about it, guys. How many of you actually get in this position ever? <laughs> we don't use it, right? Um, the way our bodies work, if we're not using certain positions or we're not doing certain things with our body, we start losing it, as, especially as we're getting older. So if you look at your kids, uh, you know, the younger kids are so flexible and you see them doing a lot of these because, you know, I'll have them do frog jumps and they get in this position mm -hmm. and they're like jumping away. It's like no big deal at all. Us, we don't get into these positions. Why don't we get into these positions? We should. Um, one of the ways, honestly, as a PT, if people start having knee problems, if you're getting in certain positions, first of all, you'll have more flexibility. So you wouldn't have as much of those issues as you're getting older. And second is, even if you were starting to have arthritis and stuff, you'll catch it a lot earlier. Because yes. you're putting yourself in that position and you're starting to realize what your body is capable of doing and what it's not capable of doing. So it's something that we have when we are younger and we lose it because we are not using it. So yes, this is one of those positions you almost never get into ever. So hence the reason you should start getting into yes. it right? and make it part of the routine, you know, whether you're doing every other day, every three days, but this is why you need to get, start getting into it because we are not doing it. I so couldn't that's agree why. more. Does yeah. it look difficult? It's okay. You start somewhere and you work your way up. 100%. And also, and Dr. Farine knows this as well, most of the rest of the world uses this position a lot because consider if you've ever done a lot of travel in other countries, this is the way that many people sit outside their home to cook or bake or work with uh, shelling peas or working on embroidery. This is the way handwork is done. And so these are also countries in which older people tend to be much healthier because they work the knees and the hips. <laughs> yes, I was actually traveling to Pakistan uh, over the summer, and even my kids had to do it. I the first thing I taught them was like, "Okay, this is it. This is how we use the bathroom here." Mm -hmm. Reality check, and I shot, showed them, and I taught them, and I was like, "It is what it is, and that's what we're doing." And honestly, went back home a lot less people have knee problems. 
That is true. And even if you go to a technologically advanced city such as Tokyo in Japan, if you go into yes. the restrooms and department stores, the restrooms are made so that you are in a squat like this to use the restroom. Yeah. You know, yeah. another thing I've done over here, because obviously we can't do the squat, they have the squatty potty uh, that you can yeah. just order that just brings the floor up to you. I mean, another, since we're oh, discussing wow. it, another, you know, <laughs> just like that, it just brings it up to you. So <laughs> you're absolutely right. Um, it's it's a position we don't use. Hence the reason we really need to get into that position because we're not using it. Agreed. Do we have time for one last awesome? Yes, list? please. Let's do one more. Okay, we're going to look at plank pose. It's called falasana in Sanskrit. And the tricky bit about plank pose is that it's actually the upper part of what you think of as a push up. So let me show you getting into it. You would often start from tabletop pose, walk the hands out front, curl the toes under, and then simply push yourself forward and lift the knees. So basic plank pose. But once again, look at my spinal alignment. My backside, my gluteus muscles are up. My back is sagging down. I really don't have good spinal alignment. And because of that, I'm putting a lot of undue stress here on the lower spine. This is called the lumbar spine. So what I want to do, get those fingers wide, press them into the mat, and then push the heels back. The athletic term is spike the heels toward the back of the mat and then let your gaze be forward on the front of the mat. You're not gonna look down at the mat, you're going to look out here. Once you do that, the head, neck, and spine come into alignment much better. I'm not wearing a, a very form-fitting shirt, but if I were, you'd see much better alignment. You wanna make sure those hips stay down and in alignment. If they start going up, then maybe that means you're getting fatigued. And so what you can do is use blocks. I'm going to put the blocks here on uh, their halfway height. This is low, this is high, this is halfway. I've got them shoulder distance apart. I'm going to place my hands on them so I'm gripping the block as if I'm about to pick it up. This lets me set the base of the palm down on the block and feel solid while my fingers grip both sides and so I'm able to press down, almost as if I'm going to walk on the blocks. Curl my toes under, lift my hips, Okay, come up straight, get my gaze out front, and you'll notice it's very easy to get a good straight back just because you've brought the floor up about six inches higher, and this somehow takes a little bit of extra pressure off the body. Does it mean that it makes it easier overall? Not really, because you're still using the muscles of the biceps, triceps, and the forearm as the main load-bearing muscles, and you're still spiking those heels toward the back, but that little bit of elevation makes it easier for you to think about spinal alignment. And as Dr. Farin said, it's the little things that make the difference. Sure, you can do it with a sagging back and with hips maybe a little out of alignment, but you will not receive as much toning and you won't receive overall as much health benefit from it as if you did more alignment. Dr. Farin? Yes. And honestly, everybody wants to do this pose anyways because everybody wants to work on their core. <laughs> muscles and everything. So now you know a, a easier way of doing it, a better way of doing it, what it needs to look like. Um, you know, it planking is some a lot of people like like doing. Um, it's also the beginning stages of if you want to start doing push-ups and you can't do a push-up, start with planking. And if you keep increasing time over over the period of time, you'll start be able to get enough strength in your uh, you know arms and stuff where you can start doing push-ups. So I, I love planking, especially for when I'm working with somebody who cannot do a push-up, we can always start with planks and then work our way up. It's amazing. It works your whole body, your core, your upper body, lower body. It's, it's, I love it. It's one of my favorite poses to do. Dr. Farine makes a good point. The plank pose is a gateway to so much more because you can go then into side plank, side plank with one leg elevated. You can go over into Kamat Karasana, which is also called wild thing. It's a great gateway pose. Yes, 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 yes. Um, again, uh, Dr. Sandra, I want to thank you. You did such an amazing job. Thank I know you. we only covered four poses today, but you guys can see the difference when you know what are those little tiny changes you need to make in order to get where you need to be and to make the difference when it comes down to doing yoga, uh, you know, and that's what you need. That's why just watching a video um, and trying to follow it, yes, it will help. But as you can see, those little changes is what 
you know, puts you over the edge and, you know, does True. what you need to do. Um, Dr. Sandra is actually uh, is published. She has published a book uh, which is called Taking Myths to the Mat. And uh, it's definite. I'm going to put the information um, in the link below. So you guys can look that also look that up. And um, yeah, definitely. This is something that you guys need to start incorporating in your life. Um, if you have more questions specifically about yoga or even uh, certain poses, um, you know, leave us comments, ask us questions, and then uh, I will get back to Dr. Sandra. Yeah. <laughs> Bring her back. <laughs> and yes. then, you know, start working on those as well, because it makes such a huge difference if you're doing the pose the correct way. And yes. that's where you see all the changes and all um, the, the results that you want. Um, and the key is honestly not giving up. This is something I've been talking to you guys about from the beginning of our wellness series. The whole point is to make those lifestyle changes, taking the holistic approach, making these changes. So it's something that you're doing on a regular basis. Um, honestly, I've done a lot of yoga classes online also, and I did a mommy and me one and kids love it. Like they had such a blast. Um, if you guys want, maybe one time I'll do that as well. I'll, I'll make a video for that. Mommy and me poses. The kids love. So moms are having fun. The kids are having fun. It's a bonding time and you're doing exercise. So what best <laughs> better way, right? Best of both worlds. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Sandra again. Thank you so much thank for you. coming on and uh, teaching the, the viewers all this amazing, amazing way of doing these poses and the nitty gritty and how it actually helps not just while you're doing exercise in your overall lifestyle changes also like we were talking about just sitting properly and uh, doing certain poses that we just we don't get to put our bodies in those positions at all you might start with five seconds only then you'd go to 10 seconds then 20 and that's where it begins you know nobody's an expert day one i'm still not an expert believe me i can't do certain poses um <laughs> And when I'm teaching the class, people can. Some people can. I just can't do it. But And that's okay. <laughs> but thank you so much, guys, for uh, tuning in. Stay, um, stay connected. You have any questions, comments, please let us know. And uh, we will keep making more videos that will help you, whatever questions you have, and we will try to answer it. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Sandra, for taking the time out and um, teaching thank us. You. Thank you.